We go now to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who is at the State Department. Good morning to you, Mr. Secretary. Morning, Margaret. Good to be with you. Tension is very high in the region. Are you changing your security posture? Are you pulling any U.S. personnel out of the area? Uh, Margaret, we are concerned at the, the possibility of uh, Iranian proxies escalating their attacks against our own personnel, uh, our own people. Um, we're taking every measure to make sure that we can defend them and, if necessary, respond decisively. Not at all what we're looking for, not at all what we want, but we'll be prepared if that's what they choose to do. So that sounds like quite possibly uh, pulling people out. Um, in terms of the threat from Iran you just referenced there, President Biden in his Oval Office address said that the U.S. would hold Iran accountable. What does accountable mean? Well, what you've seen already, uh, Margaret, is very, a very clear message from the president, backed up by the deployment of um, two of our largest aircraft carrier battle groups, uh, to make sure that it's clear no one should take advantage of this moment to, to escalate uh, to further attacks on Israel or, for that matter, attacks on us, on our personnel. Uh, and this is not by way of, uh, in terms of what we're doing by, by provocation. Uh, it's designed to deter, designed to make clear that no one should use this moment in any way to escalate. Um, no one wants a second front, a third front, uh, and at the same time, we want to make sure that our own people in the region, wherever they are, uh, are safe and protected and that we're in a place as we are to respond decisively if we need to. The um, president's been clear about that, both in what he said and in what we're doing. We'll stay tuned. Um, in terms of what's happening in Gaza, I know there are an estimated five to 600 Americans there. There are only two ways out. Uh, one is through the Rafah gate to Egypt. It does not appear any Americans have made it out that way. There's also another Eretz crossing into Israel. Is there any chance Israel lets some of those Americans out or Egypt allows some of those Americans in? Uh, we have, as you're, you're exactly right, we have uh, several hundred Americans and other nationalities, other civilians um, from, from other countries who want to leave Gaza. Uh, we've had uh, people uh, come to, uh, to Rafah, the crossing with Egypt, and to date at least, Hamas has blocked them from leaving, showing once again its total disregard for civilians of any kind uh, who, are, who are stuck in Gaza. Uh, this is something that we're working, uh, again, uh, virtually every single day. Uh, we have uh, in the re right now in the region on the ground one of our most experienced diplomats, David Satterfield, working with the, uh, the different governments concerned, uh, with, uh, with Israel, with Egypt, uh, to make sure that we're ready uh, to be able to get people out, assuming Hamas lets them move. So really, the ball is in Hamas's court in terms of letting people who want to leave, civilians from third countries, including Americans, get out of Gaza. Just to be clear, you're saying Hamas is preventing Americans from leaving Gaza? That's correct. And there are no U.S. personnel who are able to help on the ground? We have U.S. personnel on the other side of the border in Egypt, consular personnel who can immediately help and assist those, those Americans who want to leave. We're working this very, very actively every day, including with partners who may have um, influence, connections with Hamas that we don't have uh, to make sure that people can get out. So we're tracking this. Uh, we want to make sure it happens. In terms of uh, the Americans who are believed to be unaccounted for or potentially hostages, does Hamas have all of them or do other militant groups have them? Look, you'll understand I can't speak to the, uh, to the details of this. We've been engaged from virtually uh, the first day of this. Uh, when, it be clear, when it was clear that Hamas had taken men women, young children, elderly people, hostage, including um, Americans. Uh, it was really gratifying. Yesterday, I got a chance to speak to uh, the two Americans, the mother-daughter, um, mm -hmm. uh, Judith and Natalie Renan, who were released. Um, I spoke to them. Uh, we are very appreciative of the assistance that we got from the government of Qatar to make sure that they could uh, get out and now soon be reunited with their families. We're hopeful that, that others follow. It is imperative that every single hostage every single hostage of whatever nationality be released immediately and without condition. But the Israeli invasion appears imminent. Have you asked the Israeli government to delay in order to give you more time to broker the release of these hostages? First, step back for a second because it's important to remember what happened. It's incredible how quickly that gets lost because it was only a couple of weeks ago that Hamas invaded Israel with uh, its terrorist fighters and slaughtered 
and I use that, that word very deliberately, slaughtered so many uh, people. Again, right. men, women, young children, babies, uh, old people, uh, you name it. And they continue to rain rockets down on Israel. When I was there a few days ago, we, were in the, we, were, we had to take shelter a couple of times because of Understood. incoming rockets from Hamas. So my point is this, no country, no country can be expected to tolerate this, uh, to live with this. And as we said from the start, Israel has both the, the right and even the obligation, not only to defend itself, but to try to make sure that, to the best of its ability, this can't happen again. So we talk to the Israelis about uh, uh, what, they're, what they're planning. Uh, we give them our best advice. It's important, as we said, not only what they do, but how they do it, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to making sure that civilians are as protected as they possibly can be in this crossfire of Hamas is making. Um, we want to make sure that humanitarian assistance gets in, and both countries uh, care deeply about the, the hostages. There are many, many Israelis uh, who are hostage, and of course, hostages from other nationalities. So we're working to do everything we can using whatever um, uh, levers, uh, partnerships, relationships we have mm -hmm. to get them out. Israel's doing the same, but in terms of what we're talking to Israel about in their, with regard to their military operations, it really is focused on uh, both how they do it and how best to achieve the results that they seek. So let's talk about how they do it. Um, you're, you're right to lay out just how absolutely horrific that attack was two weeks ago. Turning the page to what has happened during the following two weeks, UNICEF says 1,524 children have been killed in the Gaza Strip during these bombings. Why isn't the U.S. calling for at least a temporary ceasefire? First, Margaret, when I hear the stories, when I see the pictures of young children who have lost their lives in this conflict of Hamas is making, whoever they are, wherever they are, whether they're Palestinians, uh, whether they're Israelis, whether they're, they're Jews or Muslims, it hits me, and I know it hits virtually everyone, right in the heart. And that's why it's so important to do everything possible uh, to protect them, uh, and why it's so important to do everything possible to get assistance to those who need it. So Food, why not ask for at least a, a temporary pause in the bombing, we've, as was proposed at the seen, this week? We've seen, first of all, that uh, in order to get assistance in, um, We've had, uh, we've had that happen, and you saw the first 20 trucks go in yesterday. I expect more will follow today and the day after that. We want to make sure that we have sustained delivery of, of, of food, medicine, water, the things that people need. At the same time, uh, I said something a minute ago that, that we, have to re we have to remember. Mm -hmm. um, Israel has to do everything it can to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, freezing things in place where they are now would allow Hamas to remain where it is and to repeat what it's done sometime in the future. No country could accept that. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, who is on the ground in Israel and has traveled to the West Bank conducted an interview with Mr. Mustafa Barghouti, a pol Palestinian politician I'm sure you know. Mm. He said he doesn't understand why President Biden, when he was in Israel, did not say enough is enough. You wanted to respond and you responded. You killed 4,000 Palestinians. Stop. Instead, you're encouraging a ground invasion. How do you respond to enough is enough? Uh, enough is enough should have been uh, the case with, uh, with Hamas uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it would be good to hear the entire world speaking clearly and with one voice about the actions that Hamas took, about the slaughter of people, about the fact that that should be absolutely intolerable, unacceptable to anyone, anywhere, any country, mm -hmm. any people. Um, second, as I said, for, for a country to not only not respond, it's not about responding, it's not about retaliating, it's about defending Israel from these ongoing attacks. As I said, the rockets continue to this day. And it's about taking the steps necessary uh, to try to make sure, to the best of Israel's ability, that this can't yeah. happen again. Now, as, a, yeah. as we said very clearly, the president's been very clear about this, how Israel does that matters. Um, making sure that, to the greatest extent possible, civilians are protected. Civilians are deliberately put in the crossfire by Hamas. Hamas undertook yeah. the slaughter. 
It knew Israel would have to respond, and yet all of its people, its senior leaders, its weapons, its tunnels, yeah. all are co-located in residential buildings. They're uh, buried yeah. underneath hospitals and schools. It knew that in Israel's necessary response, um, civilians would be caught in that crossfire. It's the last thing we want to see. It's imperative that every mm -hmm. step be taken to, to protect them. But what does anyone expect Israel to do? It can't allow uh, this situation to continue. No country can live like that. So that's mm -hmm. what's, in, I think, uh, in the minds of, um, of Israelis right now. Again, we are speaking to them, uh, as I said, about how they do it and also yeah. how they can best achieve the results that they seek. In terms of U.S. interests in the region, uh, one of America's closest allies, the King of Jordan, gave an impassioned speech saying Palestinian lives seem to matter less than Israeli ones. Our lives matter less than other lives. The application of international law is optional and human rights appear to have boundaries based on races and religions. That's a warning from one of America's closest friends in the region that this is a dangerous message to be sending and it could have blowback. Are you concerned? Margaret, every life, Palestinian, Israeli, Jewish, Muslim, Arab, every life has equal worth. When I see the reports, when I see the photographs, uh, when I hear the stories of young children, Palestinian children, who've been killed or injured, it hits me right in the gut too. Uh, just as it does when I hear, when I see these other stories, wherever it is. We had here in our own country, a little boy, six years old, Wadi, in Chicago, who was viciously murdered, apparently uh, because he was a Palestinian American. Um, a little boy, six years old, didn't do anything to anyone. I feel that strongly across the board, no matter where it is. But this is on Hamas. And the fact is, Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't represent their just cause. It doesn't represent their aspiration, uh, and legitimate aspiration for a state of their own. On the contrary, it does everything to make life worse and more miserable. Does the U.S. assess uh, that it is actually people. possible for Israel to destroy both Hamas as an entity and its ideology? Is it actually a military possibility? So you make a very good point, Margaret, and I think it's important to focus on that too. Uh, there's the military aspect of what Israel needs to do in try, trying to make sure this doesn't happen again. But you're exactly right. Uh, the best way, the only way to defeat an ideology uh, no matter how warped, uh, and in the case of Hamas, it's about as warped as it possibly can be, is uh, to make sure that there is a better, a clearer uh, alternative for people. And that alternative is very clear, and it's very stark. Mm -hmm. We have, on the one hand, countries throughout the region who want to come together to integrate, to normalize relations, and to lift up the rights of the Palestinian people, uh, to be able to have a future where they work together, go to school together, do business together, travel to each other's countries. That's one vision. Yes. The other vision is the vision that Hamas has. Death, destruction, nihilism, darkness. Now, the responsibility that those of us who believe in the first vision have is to do everything possible to make it real mm -hmm. so that people not only see it, but they can achieve it. That's exactly what we were working on before this horrific uh, attack on October 7th. And that's the vision that we need to get back to. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, um, we also have to deal with the fact that Hamas represents an active, ongoing threat, uh, and that has to be dealt with, too. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Margaret.